Hello everyone. This is Dr. Mahavir Yadav, PG residence in the Department of Radio Diagnosis of Kalinga Institute of Medical Science, Bhubaneshwar. I am here to present my paper on the topic Glomus Jugular Paraganglioma, a case series in imaging review. To start with, the paragangliomas are rare neuroendocrine tumors that arise from paraganglion or chromaffin cells originating from the neural cells, also called as glomus tumors or chemodectomas. Paragangliomas of the head and neck represent less than 1% of head and neck tumors, generally benign locally in aggressive tumors. Malignancy with maxillin 2-13% of the cases. Now, this paraganguloma can arise from sympathetic chain or parasympathetic. The sympathetic paraganguloma usually secrete the cat colomines and are located in the sympathetic par paravertical uh, ganglion of the thorax, abdomen, and the pelvis. The sympathetic can be adrenal or extra adrenal. Extra adrenal, like from the thorax, abdomen, and pelvis, uh, can be 15 to 35% malignant. Adrenal, mainly fucrome cytoma. 10% malignant. Parasympathetic, more than 90% of all the paraganglomas are parasympathetic. And primarily from the head and neck, that is the characteristic body, and mostly they are benign in nature. The tumors arise from any three glomus bodies, that is the jugular bulb, tympanic branch of the ninth cranial nerve, that is the Jacobson nerve, auricular branch of the 10th cranial nerve, that is the Arnold's nerve. The main arterial supply is the ascending pharyngeal artery. Has supralateral growth and can spread into middle ear, mastoid ear cells, and the stretch tube. Now coming to the cases. Case 1. A 37-year-old male came with a complaint of fullness of right ear. On otoscopy, a small radius mass was seen behind the intact past tensor. No cranial deficits were noted. The axial CT, that is, the figure A demonstrates the erosion of the right jugular bulb with the moth eaten appearance of the valves of the right jugular foramen. There is no invasion or extension into the middle ear, as the cochlear promontory that we can see is intact. Now, the figure B and C are the axial and the coronal C2 weighted MR images, which demonstrate a well defined. Predominantly C2 hyperintense expansile lesion centered in the right jugular foramen. There is no extension into the middle ear, is seen. Characteristic salt and paper appearance is present with punctate regions of hyperintensity representing the salt, while the small flow voids represent the paper. Now, the case two. A 55 years old female came with a complaint of right ear pain and discharge in the ear associated with tinnitus. She mentioned the beginning of the symptoms six years ago. For two months, she complained of dizziness, nausea, vomiting, and headache radiating to the whole cranium. Upon right otoscopy, otoria and the presence of a tumor in the external auditory meatus was noted. The neurological examination of the patient was normal. The audiometry showed right mixed hearing loss. Now here, we can see the figure A and B, which is both the axial and the coronal CT images, which demonstrate the erosion of the right jugular bulb with a moth eaten appearance of the walls of the right jugular foramen. Expansion into the middle ear cavity is seen with invasion of the cochlear promontory. Now the figure C and D represent the axial and coronal T1 weighted post contrast MR images, which demonstrate the avid enhancement of the mass which arises between the jugular foramen and the cochlear promontory. The mass fills the jugular foramen and extends in the middle ear anterolaterally. Now the case three. In the case three, we have a 60 year old woman presented with symptoms of hearing loss, pulsatile ringing sound in the left ear for the last four years. The patient also had difficulty in swallowing for the last nine months. On examination, there was a, uh, also left palatal paresis and the absent gag ref reflex on the left posterior pharyngeal one. On otoscopy, a pulsatile radius mass was in behind the intact past tensor. 
Now you can see the left sided glomus jugular paraganular mass, skull base. Uh, the figure A is the axial and the figure B is the coronal image of the city that demonstrates a permeative destruction and enlargement of the jugular foramen with extension into the posterior cranial fossa. So what do you mean by the permeative? Permeative means the destruct, uh, destruction of the bone with complete lo loss of the normal cortex and the loss of the normal architecture of the bone. Here we can easily see in these images. Now, the figure A, B, and C are the uh, A is the T1 axial image, MR image, uh, T1 axial, MR image, it shows a high point in schema. T2 weighted axial image, the figure B, is the high, it shows the hyper intense tumor. And the T1 weighted post contrast coronal image, that is C, it shows the intense tumor enhancement. Tumor is seen expanding the jugular foramen and uh, extending posteriorly. Now here we can see the images 1A, 1B and 2. The 1A, 1B are the DSA image. That is 1A is before embolization, which is demonstrating the characteristic intense tumor plus. The 1B is after selective embolization. That is the significant reduction in the vascular blurs, indicative of the radius arterial supply to the tumor. And we can see the histo image in the figure 2 which is the epithelioid chief cells that is arranged in the distinctive clusters, which is known as the uh, gel balloon nest pattern, which is separated by the permanent fibrovascular stoma. Now, coming to the discussion part, jugular foramen is the bony canal located in the skull base between the patrous portion of the temporal and the occipital bone that transmits the vessels and the cranial nerves from the skull base to the parotid space. So this foramen is divided into two parts, anteromedially and the posterolaterally. The anteromedial part is known as the pars nervosa and the posterolateral part is known as the pars vascularis, which is divided uh, by, the, uh, by the jugular spine of the petrous bone. Uh, the pars nervosa con uh, contains the inferior petrosal sinus and the uh, ninth cranial nerve. The pars vascularis contains the jugular bulb, 10th uh, cranial nerve and the 11th cranial nerve. Now, coming to the epidemiology, it is a rare with an estimated annual incidence of one case per 1.3 million people. But clomus tumors are common tumors of the middle cavity and the temporal bone. Occurs in 40 to 60 years of age with a female predominance and more common on the left side. Can be bilateral or multicentric, especially in the familial cases. The clinical features uh, pulsatile tinnitus loss of hearing, retrotympanic mass, cranial neuropathy involving the 19th and 11th nerve. Uh, presentation depends on the degree of the medulla involvement. The radiological features. On CT, we will see the mass in the jugular foramen with the permeative destruction changes of the adjacent bone. That is a typical moth eaten appearance. On T1 weighted image, high point and salt and paper appearance salt due to the hemorrhage and paper due to the flow voids. On T2 weighted images, mix hypointense mass with the flow voids. On contrast, avid intense homogeneous enhancement will be seen. Perfusion, elevated perfusion values with rapid dynamic enhancement. On angiography, enlarged feeding arteries, intense tumoral, blood, early draining veins will be seen. On indium, 111 level octreotrite, early intense uptake will be there due to the presence of stomatostin receptors. Now, Glasgow-Jackson classification is there. It is divided into type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4. In type 1, there is a small tumor involving only the jugular bulb, middle ear, or the mastoid. In type 2, extension will be under the inter internal auditory canal with or without the intracranial extension. Type 3, extension will be in the petrous epic with or without the intracranial extension. In type 4, extension will be beyond the petrous apex into the clivus or infratemporal fossa with or without the intracranial extension. The surgical approach may change depending on the extent of tumor invention. In type 1 and type 2 uh, will be the, limited to the skull-based approach. And in type 3 and type 4, the surgical approach will be more extensive and it will be limited to the infratemporal approach. In treatment, observation will be done, like periodic monitoring for tumors less than 2 centimeters. Radiotherapy will be done if the goal of 
is not the tumor removal, it is the tumor stability. Surgery will be preferred treatment when the tumor, high bulk tumor will be there. Secondly, resection would not sacrifice adjacent structures. Preoperative arterial embolization can be done before surgery or non-functioning paraganglioma to reduce the bleeding com complication. What are the differentials? Jugular sonoma. In the jugular sonoma is one of the differentials. In it, no internal flow voids will be there. Sharply demarcated smooth bony margins will be there. Not very vascular on angiography. Indium 111 label octotide will be negative. Supramedial growth will be there. Meningioma. In the meningioma, meningioma is a T1 hypointensity to hyperintense lesion with avid enhancement. Formative sclerotic bone changes. Encasement of ossicles will be there without the destruction or erosion. And the centrifugal growth will be there in case of meningioma. Uh, metastasis. Jugular foramen mass with irregular and destructive margins will be there. T1, T2, isointense lesion. No diffusion restriction. Increased perfusion in the hypervascular metastasis. Chondrosarcoma. Usually mass will be seen medial to the jugular foramen in chondrosarcoma. T1 isointense and T2 hyperintense. Rings and arcs calcification will be present. So finally, coming to the conclusion, the conclusion is that paraglomas are very rare, often asymptomatic tumors. Characterization of the tumor extent is necessary as they have an intimate association with nerves and vessels. Specific therapeutic approach may vary depending on tumor location and extent as defined by imaging. The presence of concomitant tumors should be verified as paraglomas are multifocal in 30% of the patients. Thank you very much.